And we have the absolute honour of having Kelly in the house to finish up uh, the week of Really Good Radio. Good morning, Kelly. Good morning. Thanks for having me. You're more than welcome. Thanks for joining us. How's uh, how's your week been? You're not at the Olympics, the Paralympics. Uh, no. Are you dealing with that okay? You know what? I am. I'm, I am. I'm, I have to say that sometimes I I struggle watching it because it would be lovely to be there. But I made the decision myself to not be there. Uh, I was on track to most likely qualify, and looking at the the start up and the the line of girls that are competing, um, I would have been up there. But, you know, I decided to pull out quite some time ago due to family matters and also COVID. So, yeah. Yeah, fair enough. Hey, um, we've got plenty of listeners out there that are super keen to hear uh, about yourself. Um, They can find a lot of information about you and you've probably been asked a billion times the same thing. So happy to kind of dig around and talk about things that you want to talk about. But um, I'm really interested in uh, uh, a few things. In particular, how long was the process of when you got the diagnosis that and someone's saying, you know, I think it's a bit of a, oh, it's not that bad, but then you realise these are your choices, survive or not survive. How long was that process? Did that feel like forever in your head, but it wasn't? Or what was going on? It kind of, it didn't, it was about two years actually I complained from sore knee to when I got completely diagnosed. Um, So it went from physios to doctors to exercises to massage, you name it, I had it. I even had a scan done in that time and they told me that it was just a cyst and it would go away. And then from that moment of being told that I could have minor surgery and the pain would be relieved, I decided to go for minor surgery. And then within that minor surgery and my amputation and diagnosis was two weeks. So that went so quickly of Oof. having two to having one leg. But the <laughs> two years of having a sore knee and having to give up a sport I loved was it was a long process. I, I'm not. <laughs> I, I do some really rude comparisons sometimes. So please uh, turn a blind eye. Okay. It feels like New Year's Eve. Like you know, you go building up for like a month, and then all of a sudden it's over in 24 hours. You're like, what? This is crazy. Yeah. Like it's all it's all done now. Now you've made a, a, a huge decision. Um, tears. Uh, what was oh. going, like? What did you go through? Like you're the one that goes to put your head on the pillow at night, and it, no one's there to go you'll be right you'll be right or it's quiet silence can you remember those first few nights where it was just dead silent you go i'm i'm gonna not have a limb yeah i remember being told that i had cancer and i was 15 so i'd seen my my grandparents both die of cancer right uh and i automatically just thought i'm going to die that was just my my mindset i didn't realize that you know all these treatments and what what could could come in the future i automatically thought the worst and i remember looking at my parents and they thought the worst too seeing the youngest child diagnosed with cancer and yeah i also remember the night before my amputation and my friends came over and we had somewhat of a a party and they were so supportive but you're right they were the ones going home uh not thinking about this when i was the one that had to go through it and they had no idea what i was going through and i went i went through the stage of why me but i got over that very quickly because i I have to remember that I was part of an oncology ward with, with children and ah. the cancer in my knee had not spread to my body and I was so lucky for after two years of not being picked up that it hadn't. So I started to look at my life as in, well, yes, I lose my leg, but I get to keep my life. So I, I tried not to stay in that moment of why me for too long um, before losing my leg and obviously learning to walk again was another story. But, yeah, it was it was really tough and um, being a mum myself, but for some reason when I was 15, I did realise how hard it was for my parents and that's what kept me going strong was I wanted to show them that I was okay because I wanted them to be okay. It's part of that belonging process was was the Olympics. Uh, should I be calling it the Olympics or Paralympics? Paralympics. Cool. I <laughs> yeah. Just, I just, yep, yeah, cool. Um, the Paralympics, <laughs> was that part of the healing process as well and that, uh, that part of belonging, knowing that, uh, I mean, you walk into the Paralympics and you certainly uh, are... There's familiarity. People probably understand you in a collective manner more than the rest of the world when you're walking around the street and stuff. Um, was that was uh, there? How was the Olympics for you? The Paralympics, the first time you got there. Oh, it was incredible. I think you've got to remember. I sort of went lost my leg, and it wasn't until about nearly two years later that I had my eyes open to the Paralympics. I didn't really, to be honest, it's not like it wasn't on our TV screens back in the day. I'm really <laughs> nah. sorry. <laughs> um, but it wasn't on TV back in the day, so I didn't realise the kind of disabilities and disciplines they had. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. 
a teacher came up to me and told me about the Paralympics and said there was people like me and I was you know being 15 and not meeting anybody with a disability it was eye-opening to be part of something that was incredible but also everyone had a story everyone had mm. an idea what someone had gone through um, and it was great to be part of that family but it, it 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 took a long time for me to you know feel comfortable getting back into sport I would wear shorts on 40 uh, pants on 40 degree days because I didn't want people to look at me differently so yes the Paralympics was a huge healing thing for me because it made me feel comfortable being around those sort of people and sport gave me that confidence back to to be who I wanted to be yeah wow um, how can the Paralympics uh, be a driver to invite change? Now we are seeing a lot more media coverage and uh, we've talked about it this week. It's pretty obvious. It's everywhere now and certainly in the RGR world, our, our radio community, we've been just pumped to watch it from Monday. We've talked about goalball and boccia and people watching the, the wheelchair rugby going, what is going on? These people are going to crash their heads off. What is going on? It's yeah. great. It's great. It's all part of it. Um Aside from the Olympics, let's talk about the Paralympics. What's what's the importance to you uh, in representation? Is it super powerful times of Paralympics? Oh, look, I've always believed that change and understanding comes from children. So we need to have those mm. conversations earlier. It's, it's in primary school. It's even before of showing people showing kids that people are different on the outside, but it doesn't mean that they're different on the inside. So I think we I think schools are huge on showing the Olympics. You've got to, they, you know, I remember them wheeling the TV in to watch Ian Thorpe and and all those yeah. kind of things, the races. But we didn't know we didn't watch any Paralympic races then. And um, now I think you know the Olympics is done. Let's let's wheel that TV in for the preps and the grade ones and the rest of the primary school and show them the Paralympics and show them the different disabilities, the different countries, the stories behind these people. But show them that they're doing incredible things just because they may have one arm, one leg vision impaired it doesn't um limit them they can do everything they want to do and you know yeah like i believe that we need to have those conversations early with children and also it's important for someone at school who may have a disability to see themselves on tv mm. um be able to see that you know there's there's chance and there's hope and there's all those dreams that they can do have you completely accepted your uh, you talk about it that as a teenager it would have been tough where are you headspace wise now um, you've probably moved on a lot and grown up naturally as we do from a teenager. Is there still battles within? Oh, look, um, I accepted having one leg very early, very early. And, and I think that was just a huge part of who I am and who my parents brought me up to be, mm. was to be resilient and a strong, tough person. And I realised that this was my life and um, I've got to take it with two hands and keep going. And not one day goes by that I, I regret my decision or I'm upset about having one leg. Sure, I have battles, then my leg's sore or my leg's not fitting and I can't do the things that I wanted to do that day. Um, but I've learnt to focus on the positive that I'm here today, I'm alive today, not a lot of cancer patients are. Um, and I, I, you know, I, I take a step back when I have those moments of frustration and, yeah, focus on what I do have. So it, it's, it's, it's hard and I've met people that haven't accepted it and it's it's a journey for everybody and everybody has their own battles. Um, but for me, it's it's who I am and I wouldn't be the person, I wouldn't have travelled the world if, if I hadn't yeah. gone through what I did. Carol Cook joined us yesterday and talked about the pity party. you got to have a pity party. <laughs> she embraces the pity party, you know. I think it's important to, to everyone, you don't have to not feel sad or get down. You're yeah. allowed to be. Make sure you don't stay there too long because that's when you start getting in your darkest moments. But you are definitely allowed to have a pity party. And I, my poor parents, when I first lost my leg, they were uh, my punching bags. And I remember <laughs> my dad and I'm pretty sure I threw my leg at my dad a few times. So um, I'm sorry. <laughs> so, yeah. An amazing moment. Uh, not all of us get to be put on billboards, let alone a um, a silo. Yeah, yeah. What is going on here? You're uh, not the lady on the left, FYI. No. Yes, <laughs> That's uh, no. maybe in fifty years you can <laughs> you can take that <laughs> position. You got put on a silo. What's tell tell us a little bit about this? Oh yeah, oh, it's incredible, isn't it? Especially because I feel like Geelong is is always in my heart. It's where I grew up. It's the people that actually helped me become a Paralympian by raising money for my first leg. So to be honoured in that way and to be part of the town, even though it is ripped down now, I thought I'd like to a little bit more. Heritage <laughs> 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 listed. 
Yeah, well, like I say, you haven't made it unless you're on the silo in Geelong. So it's incredible. And Roan did such an amazing job. And to paint that by himself, um, one square at a time, he, it, it's incredible. And I've, he actually sent me the a blown up photo of it. So it's in my hallway. So I'll always cherish that and remember it. And lots of people took um, pictures of it and sent it to me when they drove past it all the time. So it was nice. You're very, um, you know, you're very casual. Uh, about you know, stop stop pointing out the differences. We're all the same. It's all good. Uh, you know, you you just want equality. Um, does moments like that surprise you when someone like Roan rings you up and goes, "Hey, you want to want to put you in a silo?" Do you just go, "What? Hang on, what? Why?" I, I, but you know, you could look at your rap sheet and go, "Okay, there's there's a reason why." But he seems like you're not really living in the uh, achievements world. Going, woohoo! I got all these things. It's like, but. These are these are big things, like big things. Are these nice to sit there and be told, "Hey, you are special for who you are and what you've done." Yeah, that's that's one of the special things being on the silo. There's certain things that really um, hit home for me, and I never forget where I came from or what I've done because it's it, it's incredible for people to to know my name, to know what I've done, to to want to celebrate the things that I've done as a human. So it is amazing. And and look, the, the awards and things, that can be hard sometimes because when you're an athlete, you're always searching for the next one and the next one. So you never really sit down and appreciate what you've done. Um, but to be recognised, you know, to go on TV shows, to um, be asked to be in a model um, ad, it's I have to sit back sometimes and go, wow, they've asked me out of all these people. So it is, it is quite humbling and incredible. And OAM, how often do you write OAM on the end of your name? You know what? I actually, I've written some emails lately and I haven't got it in my signature, but I've been, if I want something, I write OAM at the end of my name. I've been doing that lately. <laughs> Drop it in. I was, when I was typing your stuff on social media, like, I I feel a blight. I feel like it's disrespectful if I don't. It's like, yeah. So I think it's a, it's another, a little badge. What, what, what was that day like for you? Oh, that was incredible to, to be in that hall with all those people and, uh, my mum and dad were there. Um, to be recognised, like I said, for the achievements and the and the hard work that I put was yeah, it was amazing. Uh, what's your what's your what's your favourite sport to represent? Because you've done a few. Oh yeah, long jump um, would will, will always be my favourite event. I did start off just the sprinting, but then came long jump, and I just really enjoyed it. It wasn't running up and down the track. Um, <laughs> I, it, was little, it was running and jumping into Zambia. It's a little bit. Too cold. Uh, that was, you know, that's where my heart is. But I really enjoyed powerlifting. I love lifting weights. I love trying to be the best. That's sort of, oh. um, I'm very competitive, especially in the gym. I always like being the best there. So that was incredible. But, you know, running on my running blade and jumping into the sandpit is is always going to be my favourite. You talk about an ankle, ankle injury that led you to um, going away from running. Um, is the injuries on your body um, from having an amputated leg is there a a tilt or an overcompensation that your body has to deal with that um a a leg would probably avoid uh yeah is it related Um, does your body take a hit further up like your spine do you have to work on going to see the fizz and getting your spine aligned all that all that jazz for that (laughs) did you notice Look, my ankle injury is 100% because I'm an amputee. Uh, when I lost my leg and you're 15 and you get told, don't hop everywhere, don't do this, but yeah. you know, 15 year old is like, I'll do what I want. <laughs> so um, I would hop, I'd leave my leg on the floor, I'd hop everywhere, I'd jump over things, and then I went to training on it. So you got to understand that I've only got one ankle and I'm putting three times my body weight on the track, and then I'm also being naive and hopping around at home uh, and doing the things I shouldn't do. But I probably couldn't avoid it to be honest. So yeah, it was it was overuse and it was um, it was breaking down essentially. And I, I sort of knew that being an amputee and running is sometimes not ideal. But um, unfortunately, it came to the point where I couldn't put my foot on the ground in the morning. I started to hate the sport that I loved because I just could not do it properly. And I had to sit back and doctor after doctor would tell me that I have to think about my life when I'm older, about walking and you know, having kids and doing those things. So it, it essentially pushed me back to, to stop competing, which was really, really hard. But I, I, you know, I was at the top of my sport. I did what I had to do and I'm forever grateful for that. Was the conversations around children talked about when you were discussing uh, cancer? Yeah, look, I had a cancer 
um, that was about one in two to three million people. So my cancer was is very rare, and unfortunately, chemotherapy and things like that don't work for it. Um, and I actually didn't have cancer in the rest of my body, so I didn't have any treatment. I had the amputation a week after being diagnosed, um, four inches above my knee, the cancer was in my knee, so it's a safe margin, they call it. Um, so I didn't have to have chemotherapy or those kinds of things that can unfortunately um, hinder people having having babies, having that treatment. So no, it wasn't discussed at all, and um, I didn't really think that far ahead, obviously, because I didn't have to, but I, I guess, when you're, you get a bit older having one leg, you do think about having children and one leg having a prosthetic and how that would look like. But I was around Paralympians, mums, wow. dads, uh, you know, wheelchairs, mums and dads. And it's just, you realise you can do anything. You just got to find your own way of doing it. Who was your um, your buddy or your mentor when you, uh, through the Olympics world, the Paralympics world, um, who, who first came and grabbed you and went, come on, you, you're with me now. Let's I'm going to show you around. And did yeah. you have some, have some buddies that, gra- that you gravitated towards? Yeah, definitely. Like I had a best friend um, in the games, Madeline Hogan, who was a javelin thrower, and we got matching tattoos together, which in hindsight probably wasn't a good idea. <laughs> um, Those teenage he years, was, hey? <laughs> yeah, in my room um, my whole career, and I'm thankful for her because we'd come back at night and discuss things. But really, my coach, Tim Matthews, um, um, and my other coach, Nola Costa, they both took me under their wing at a very young age and I didn't know what I was capable of and they mentored me. But my main guy that my first amputee and my first Paralympic friend is Donnie Elgin. I'm sure you've heard of him. I haven't. Um, no, you've got to Google him. <laughs> um, he's also a Paralympian, a motivational speaker and just a very funny Uh, down-to-earth guy and he has mentored me from day one he's like my second dad and he puts up with a lot from me but he also has helped me from the very beginning and um he's my manager and like I said he's Mm. if if you're feeling crap one day go and go and listen to Donnie because he's gonna lift you up solid I hope we've all got um people like that in our corner this the comments are going off on the chat which you can't see uh thanks for sharing your amazing story uh what an inspiring person athlete um alan latu is on the back of that intro that i showed he's like wow what an intro um stacy says wow such a strong woman what a journey something not many could overcome in such a major way um jano so true the fizz of course fizz has got something to say what's the um i'm gonna ask here yeah i'll ask no i'm gonna ask his in a minute but the fizz is, is there and uh and maddie's there children what i've heard i haven't had a children child of my own i've got one through my lovely wife my new wife um hand me down if you call it that um (laughs) you're such a dedicated focused human being you've had to uh elite athlete it's just uh, a required dedication how have you managed um the beauty of having kids and uh enjoying the I guess the distraction or um, have you managed that okay? Having to put yourself second mm. for maybe the first time really in that capacity in your life? Look, to be honest, I struggled a lot with my first. Um, being that person that was the selfish athlete, traveling around the world, doing what I wanted, getting up when I wanted, um, to being the stay-at-home mum um, that had to, you know, be the primary carer for my child. And it was a shock to the system. It was a big shock. And, you know, that you have that little bit of um, you envy your partner that, you know, he gets up and goes to work as normal and you think, well, my life's changed dramatically and his hasn't. And, you know, he's have out of that pretty quickly. But I did, after you have a child, it's, it's one of the hardest things but the most rewarding thing. And mm-hmm. then having him there, I realised he was so much so much more important than my sport and he comes first my children come first before my sport and it it took a long time to to get my head around that and and be comfortable in my position but you know i I realized soon after that i went to the commonwealth games when max was two i think um i realized i could do both i could really do both of them (coughs) maybe not the same way that i did before but it was a juggle and i had such a supportive partner and family that helped make that happen so you you've got to find the balance and i think it was really healthy for me to have a family as well mm. because in sport I was so driven and in somewhat unhealthy lifestyle balance because you want that gold medal you want to train <clears throat> and do all that you don't you forget about the outside world and it kind of put life in perspective and had made me have that really good balance <clears throat> and you realize you can fit, fit both in yeah then you have number two kid and you realize it's a bit harder <laughs> 
Like, yeah, what? it's epic. Like I, I, I'm, a, I'm a from a single mum household, and I'm only one child, probably a big handful. But um, just women out there are just always mind blowingly incredible, and men will never understand. We'll never understand. So. <laughs> Uh, always hats off to you and and incredible um, journey you've had. Some of this, uh, we'll go to the quizzes. What's um, the fizz? What's the sport or event you're most excited to watch at the oh. current Olympics? Are you are you gravitated towards one or two events? Look, I was thinking about this the other day, and when I watched the Olympics, I found myself watching rock climbing. I absolutely loved that, which I never thought I would watch. I watched even skateboarding. So I'm not one person that just loves watching one event. I like mm. watching all of it. Um, but athletics, you know, it's, I, I know of quite a few athletes in the athletics world, so that's going to be really exciting. And um, yeah, I think I think athletics is going to be one of my main events. Wheelchair rugby, like you said, it's, um, it's nuts. Feel like we kill each other every minute. Um, <laughs> so that is, that's amazing to watch too. So yeah, I'm just I'm I'm, very, I'm in a very lucky position that I can turn on the TV and know these athletes, and I brag about it to my kids and to my <laughs> partner. And, you know, all that. Um, so it's pretty nice to be able to just, you know, have that sort of feeling. I think my parents feel the same. They love, they love watching it and dropping names. <laughs> What's that? What did you say then? Your... My parents love watching the games and also dropping the names as well. <laughs> you a little bit. Yeah. Your parents would be so, so, so proud. So proud. So proud. Who is, um, who's, your, who's, in, who's your biggest fan in your family? Oh, I think both mum and dad, but... Dad and I, Dad, Dad and I, um, we're the same people, so we clash a little bit, but we, yeah, we fight, but we get along really well as well. But he, he's the one that helped me learn how to run on my leg, we, on my walking leg, because I didn't have a running leg then. Um, and we drew 50 meters out on our driveway in 10 meter increments, and he tried to teach me how to run. And wow. you know, I wouldn't be here today without it. My mum refused to come outside because we were, I threw my leg at him at least five times in that process. <laughs> she saw us fighting and refused to come out, but he kept pushing me. And um, I'm, I think he was one of my biggest fans. He, he's always been there for me with my sport and um, encouraged me a lot. I can only imagine uh, if I was looking out the window at you and your dad practicing down the driveway and I'm just kind of peering at, oh, this is all going all right. These guys have, whoa, she just threw her leg off. She just threw her leg off down the road. What I've just said, what have I just seen? <laughs> that was exactly how it was. And then I put back on and get over it. <laughs> hey, I noticed it um, in one of your clips. Uh, you, you, you go for the, what do you call them, the starting blocks? Yes, yeah. Starting blocks versus some people uh, don't do the starting blocks. What's the go there? Well, well, I actually do starting blocks, but I do a three-point start. So I don't – I only put one hand on the ground, so I don't do the crouch position. Um, it's all it, – they're probably about 20 years ago. I'm not sure anyone used starting blocks, but obviously with time it's evolved and people have started to practice different things. It's all to do with how high your amputation is really as well. My socket is quite high, so going down so low – it actually pinches into my body, whereas some amputees' stumps are a bit lower and their socket gives them more freedom, so they do points that. It's really it's hard to explain in that world. But, um, and strength-wise, if someone's strong enough to do that, they'll do it. So it's it's all very individual, and you'll find it with um, the cerebral palsy athletes in different classes. Some won't use blocks at all. They'll mostly stand starting because it's, it's hard to balance that way. And, um, yeah, it all depends on the athlete. Your role in uh, Paralympics, um, it's you're obviously a known person. How, how are you looking at the future with Paralympics and uh, in particular long jump someone wants to uh, find out about? What's your aims for the future with long jump? Oh, okay, good, good question. Um, look, pulling, pulling out of, sorry, long story short, when I gave up um, athletics eight, nine years ago now and went to powerlifting, I thought I'd never come back. But for some reason in lockdown last year, I decided to make a comeback. Maybe it was because I could get to the track and <laughs> go outside from the kids for a little while. Yeah. Um, but I thought I've never officially retired from athletics and I think because I've always wanted to give it one more go. And my one more go was Tokyo. I came back just for Tokyo. Um, it sounds weird now because I'm not in Tokyo. Um, but I realised when I came back how much I missed it and – how great I was going. I was jumping some really big jumps in practice, sometimes bigger than what I jumped in London. And um, the competition is very hard now. I'm, I'm probably never going to be number one again, but just to make it to another Paralympic Games or an international competition will be incredible to represent my country. So um, I'm in the process of getting a jumping leg made. That's part of the reason I'm not there too. I haven't had a jumping leg for about four months and you kind of need that to compete. Right. So... 
I'm still waiting for that um, funding and you know all those things. And then I'll be back training for hopefully World Championships next year in long jump. And we'll see if I'm not too old to make it to to Paris. But it would be incredible to be able to compete again. And I do love weightlifting, powerlifting. Yeah. Um, but it's not a competitive sport for me. It never will be. I'm not sure if you ever watched how incredibly strong the Nigerians and um, a lot of those different countries are. They're incredibly strong and I'm, I'm never going to be competitive with that. But I will still um, love to lift and, and, and still be in the gym lifting heavyweights as well. Yeah. Very, very exciting stuff. Um, thank you so much, Kelly, for joining us on a Friday ahead of uh, the rest of your day. What do you got on for us today? Homeschooling. That'll yeah. be fun. <laughs> How old are your kids now? Uh, five and two. So it's not it's it's prep work, thank God, because I'm in the best of school. I can do all these prep work. <laughs> prep work with a little two year old distracting you, pulling your jumper. Yeah, and getting a five year old to concentrate. Hats off to two prep teachers because oh. he's he has an attention span of five minutes. So we do little bits and little bits, and you look. It's just getting through the day each day and it's like Groundhog Day, isn't it, down here with lockdown. So. Oh, I know, I know. <laughs> and my partner still gets to go to work, so again. Um, <laughs> oh, jab, jab, come on, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Look, I've got to get in my home gym. I really do, but it's very hard with kids, yeah. Kelly, thanks again for wrapping up the week. It's been an absolute honour and pleasure and big thanks to the Fizz for encouraging this to happen and um, we look forward to speaking to you one day soon. But um, you. check out your website. It is, what's your website again? I've got it here somewhere. www.thepartright.com.au not, not hard to forget. Ching. <laughs> you're going to write a book. I'm, I'm waiting for a book, a book tab on the on the website. Have you written a book? Is I one? haven't, but it's 100% in the, in the pipeline. I think I might have to wait for my two-year-old to maybe <laughs> 20. <laughs> Thanks. But yeah, definitely. Thanks again, Kelly, and uh, you have yourself a splendid weekend catching up on all your mates, all your mates, watching at the Olymp Paralympics, all your mates. I will, I will. Thank you so much. You're more than welcome. We'll see you again. Thank you so much. Thank you.